I guess I'll slide over. Hello again, everyone. Uh, Jay Walker, I guess for those of you I haven't spoke with, please, I guess we've got the rest of the day, unless you want to come see me in the desert, uh, <laughs> since I'll be in Monte Fagasta after Sunday. Um, I'm just going to sort of wander around. It's sort of indicative of just me in general. Uh, <laughs> I have a broad plan. I'm going to talk about myself uh, and a little bit about the research. Um, I'm eight years out of a PhD and I'm still an assistant professor. Um, I moved after year five for my fellow professors. That means I was really close to getting tenure. And so when I moved, I moved to a more research focused institution and I was like, hey, this would be my sabbatical year. If I apply for one of these, could I take it? And they said, yes, I'm assuming maybe I wouldn't get it. And so I got it. And so that's how I'm here. Uh, and sort of like a nice uh, sort of story. Uh, my background professional, I live in Norfolk, Virginia, uh, Old Dominion University, um, and I spent five years in Niagara Falls, just north of Buffalo. Um, if you can hear the accent, I'm originally from Arkansas, it's of the deep south, it's where I'd always lived before there, and so the snow sort of got a little wearing. Before I made a very long-term <laughs> commitment of having tenure, uh, I went on the market and it worked out at OPU, and I've been glad to be here. Um, before I went back to get my PhD at the University of Memphis, I worked for five years. Um, I was kind of a data nerd person, which is sort of what I still am, to be honest. Uh, I am an applied microeconomist, which just means individual decision making, really. So like your AE kind of classes, if you had it, you know, you got macro, the forest, you got micro, which is the trees. And so like if you were making decisions about whether or not to have another beer, whether or not to study an extra hour, uh, how many more years of schooling you want to take like these are individual economic decisions and so like those types of things um, specifically I'll, i work in education and labor um i've got actually i was excited i sent off it was a conditional acceptance last night so i've got 21 almost peer-reviewed publications um recently i've been working in, like extra correct well i've had a string of papers that talk about like greek membership i was greek undergrads so fraternities and sororities um, lately, I've had a couple papers on relative age effects within cohort. So uh, there are cutoffs for when you can enter kindergarten. So like I was born in July, I'm relatively young. I have a cousin born in October, he's relatively old. And a lot of the literature is focused on academic effects. Um, we have a behavioral paper that should go out in the next month. So just think, I would turn age 21 right before I started my senior year of college, where someone might turn 21 the first year of their junior year. Like, does this make a difference in terms of alcohol outcomes? Um, we've got some other ideas along these lines. It's just a lot of people have focused on early development and not necessarily maybe some of these later outcomes. Um, labor, and specifically what I'm working on here in Chile, has to do with the, the gender wage gap. Um, specifically, I've worked on gender differences in competitive situations. Um, one of my co-authors and I have used data from professional tennis, um, and specifically we also got some cool data from the game show Jeopardy. Um, and so, uh, if you're familiar with the gender literature, um, there's like a remainder. So like the, the raw gender wage gap, right? So males versus females in the United States, like 70 cents on the dollar or something like that. But, you know, we're all kind of different, right? So like females tend to select different majors. They sometimes separate from the labor market, you know, to have children. And so you need to take those things into account. And when you take those other things into account, sort of the consensus in the literature is like 5 or 10% of that that's not explained. And some of what tries to explain it is maybe males are more risk-taking. There could be situations where that lack in, of risk-taking is perhaps actually better. Um, there's some work in finance that talks about risk-taking of companies when you have females on boards, those sorts of things, and stock prices. Um, just talking about, well, maybe this could explain some of that remainder. Also, females tend to negotiate less is sort of a common finding if you go to the stock lit. Um, that's not really what I'm doing here, but like, I get excited and I'll just keep talking. So. Um, um, oh yeah, I, and so I also have a cool paper, I think, it's one of my favorites that talks about mass shootings as well. Um, I think it's a really kind of cool identification strategy. Feel free to ask me about that. But again, that's not here. <laughs> it's currently out under review. Um, my background, and so like this went into the application kind of thing, and so some of y'all probably have some of the same stories. I wish I had my stuff together as much as some of you all did when I was younger. Uh, I'm a first-gen college student, you know, the Fulbright story, right, from the Ozark Mountains in northern Arkansas. We're the people you make fun of. Uh, I, I was in high school class of 33. I was not in the top 10%. <laughs> my hometown, which I was just in, has less than 1,000 people in it. Um, let me think. My first time abroad 
like 33 if you don't count Mexico on spring break when I was 19. <laughs> but I went to Canada too. Um, and now, since I've become a full-time professor, like I just love being abroad, right? So it's like the experience, the culture, the things that I don't know, it's just as someone who never really traveled much when I was younger. It's, it's such a great experience. Um, and so now I will have also taught, because I have a research and teaching appointment here, um, I've taught a course in China, Japan just this last summer, and Kyushu in southernmost island, and now I'm going to be teaching a PhD level labor economics, one of my fields, and so it's going to be my first PhD course, I'm really excited about it. Um, hopefully we'll have courses to teach when I get there, we'll see what happens at all. Uh, so what I'll talk about, so like the general it, it hadn't occurred to me, and, and I don't know if now is the appropriate time for it. It's possible that many of you aren't familiar with the economic theory of discrimination. Um, it's a little bit different than what you may have heard. He's making Mason shake his head a little bit now. Uh, so there's a guy named Becker. He's pretty famous. He's a Nobel Prize winner for us. His PhD whatever, thesis from 40, 50 years ago really changed a lot of the way microeconomics was looked at. And when, if you ever read Freakonomics or a lot of the work that Levitt has done coming out of Chicago, like to me, his, like if it wasn't for Becker, I don't think a lot of this would have necessarily happened. Like he just really broadened what the things that the economists would look at. Uh, and he had a theory of discrimination where you have two types. You have taste discrimination. That's where you're like, oh, okay, here's Jay. Sounds like he's from Arkansas or Texas. Texas is what I actually normally get. They just know it's somewhere around there. And they're like, I don't like people from Texas. Right, so that's irrational. Right, so I, like, that's just something I think for some characteristic that I can tell about you that I don't like. And so therefore I can choose to perhaps treat you differently. But there's statistical discrimination, which is what Becker talks about. And so say perhaps, and this is the one I used to use when I worked in New York. It's Hannah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Hannah. Uh, what do you know about the Arkansas educational system? Not much. Mm -hmm. You ever heard the term, thank God for Mississippi? No. It's a joke. Well, <laughs> of course, of course, it's a joke. <laughs> um, so, so Arkansas is normally ranked number forty-nine in many things, <laughs> except for Mississippi. Or you can say things like teen pregnancy, where they might be Mississippi might be number one, but we're number two. And so the, the term we have in Arkansas is well, it would be last, but thank God. Um, <laughs> so you have. Two resumes, one front of you. Right, resume A, a Jay Walker, whatever, high school graduate, Arkansas. Uh, resume two, I'm sorry, what's your name? Sebastian. Sebastian, I apologize, Sebastian, we talked a little bit yesterday. You graduated in Texas? Yeah. Okay, and so, sight unseen, same GPA, who do you think might be better? <laughs> Texas educational system, Arkansas educational system. Oh, Texas. Right. Sorry. <laughs> right. And so, statistically speaking, it's rational to use that as a measure. Uh -huh. And so, if there are identifiable, identifiable characteristics, so like maybe by female, by sexual preference, by, by race, that you know, and you're making decisions on that, it may be rational, but it's still illegal, by the way. And so, that's statistical discrimination. And there's some different ways where you can talk about who's discriminating, whether it's customers, the employer, or the employees, sort of the effects this has. And so like maybe I just want to work with people like me, or maybe customers discriminate. And so in that case, it's really hard to make a difference. And there's discussions about this within retail too, because oftentimes people want to buy from people that we sort of look like, which is odd, it comes out of the side lid. Um, where was I going with that? <laughs> I don't remember. Wages are based on productivity. <laughs> That's it, right? And so generally speaking, if systematically females are less productive than males, and so again, this is where we control for differences in major, differences in years in the labor market, and there's a remainder, so that remainder is often said to be discrimination. Um, and so there hasn't been as much study about this in uh, Latin America, specifically Chile, there's like a single paper. There's also this phenomenon in Chile where you have long distance commuting. I got five left. Okay, I can talk for a while. It, I'm like Brandt. I'm a professor. I can talk. Anyway, I think he comes exciting. But, uh, that's a good question. I don't even know if I knew where I was. When I was 
Anyway, let's get back to Chile. So Chile, while relatively more developed than other countries in Latin America, has some persistent inequality and also has a more persistent wage gap than some of the other countries. And so there's a phenomenon having to do with long distance commuting. That's where I was at. Uh, whereby you have people who work in the mining industry in northern Chile. This is one of the relatively higher wage industries. Um, it's not parity in terms of like 50-50 female, but there's a significant fraction of females that work in mining. And so we have a data set, described a little bit on the next slide, that tags where people claim their home and where people claim their income from. And so we can tell if we have long distance commuters that come in and out of Monte Flagasta in the north, and we can look at some dynamics in terms of the gender wage gap with them. And so I've actually, this is one of those things where like, I have been working on this before I got here, because I'm like, I've done a couple things where I collect primary data, but oftentimes my stuff is, you know, you've got a nice big public data set. Um, this one has like a million records of it, give or take, over the course of seven years. And so I'm looking at differences. It's a repeated cross section, so it's not the same people over time, but we have seven cuts in different years. Um, and we're just going to look at, well, what seems to be the differences. And so, like, if we match females who are most alike across these different things, how much of the remainder there is. And so there's some really clever identification you can get at, but really with what's been done in Chile, like, this seems like it's going to be some movement forward just because of that. And, and so uh, Dusan, my co-author on this, and I've had some conversations, but he's busy, I'm busy. And so I'm really looking forward to next week so we can have some talk. The code book is in Spanish. Um, there's just some things that I can't seem to figure out what's going on with it. Um, and so I think there'll be some good movement soon. Data. Control. I already talked through this. Identification strategy, just some basic. Ordinarily squares regressions, propensity score matching, which I know I've used and Dusan has used, and then some quintile stuff to look at differences according to like the income distribution, higher end, middle, and sort of the lower end. Sort of the initial plan, my hopes for the coming months, and so of the publications that I've had, essentially all of those have been using US data. Uh, as I've traveled abroad, you see how differently people live in different parts of the world, and, and so like, no, I think the stuff that I've done with some of the data stuff or the Jeopardy stuff is cool. Like it's got some panache. But like even in some small way, if you can inform policy in developing countries. Uh, when I when I talk about this in my courses like macroeconomics, like the question isn't about recessions. Like so I mean, and trust me, unemployment is serious, people who are unemployed, they have less worse medical outcomes, they have uh, increased rates of domestic violence, increased rates of drug abuse, worse medical outcomes. But like, you travel to Southeast Asia, and like, it can be life and death in terms of infant mortality. And so when you're talking about issues with health and healthy countries and, and uh, well-being, this, this, can, this can be game-changing, right? And so that extreme poverty and the poverty at the lower end has improved a lot. And so that's one thing I really try to impress, is like, the world is getting better, even if the news makes it sound like it isn't all the time. Like, things have improved a lot in the last few years. Um, so I really want to establish connections. There are some overlaps between my department and the department in UCN um, with urban and regional economics. I'm a labor economist, mostly in education. Um, research partnerships with Research Agenda, just using some international data sources. Since I'm here, I mean, I'm going to teach an international, or excuse me, a labor course with PhD students who hopefully will want to do research projects, and even just whatever data they use is going to be interesting. Because I, I use stuff to say. And I really would, so we'll see if I even wrote it down right. Me gustaría tener fluencia en español. That's not So comments or questions. Was I too bad over, Mason? No, you're right. Oh, yeah.